Praise God. So our program is about profundity. This is the word that I think you need to know as a Christian. And the reason I think you need to know this is because we're living in a time when they have purposely been trying to dumb down America. Dumb down the people. They don't want you to learn anything. You find out that the education system is corrupted. They want you to believe in things that are stupid. And the math and some of the things they've got in our schools today are very shallow and compared to what they were 70, 80 years ago. So I want to bring us out a little bit to talk about people that are willing to go above the norm. Because the norm of today has to do with people that are very uneducated. And the only people that get education in certain areas is people other than you and I. We don't usually get that. But I gave you a two pieces of paper, one small one and one large one. I mentioned a little bit on the bottom one, or the small one. Down at the bottom of the page, I mentioned just briefly uh, about the word profundity. And it goes to the ideal of people being very deep. I want you to go with me to 2 Corinthians. And when I say very deep, I mean, some people can, you can talk to them and they sound very dense. You know, they just don't get it. I think some people have been dumbed down with mental medication. I think the doctors in this country have been ordered by their superiors at Big Pharma. They've been in ordered to prescribe mental medication for you, for your children. And this has been going on a long time. I cried a little bit whenever they was talking about my wife one time, because we've been married 56 years of the last week. And I've been raised with my wife almost. You know, I'm uh, 73 now, and we come up as sweethearts together, and it does hurt. And the doctor gave me a couple of prescriptions, and I look at what one of them said, and it was a mental medication, Zoloft. Needless to say, I threw that away. But you look at our soldiers are coming home and they're looking at 25 to 30 of them a day for a long period of time were committing suicide. I don't know what the count is today, but that's just been a couple of years ago. So, you know, I believe the mental medications they make them take with the vaccines and stuff like this, I believe it's made especially for that purpose. Now I want to take you into this word in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I want to show you how to stop from being a norm. And when I say a norm in America, that goes beyond average. The average Christian today doesn't know very much at all about our Bible. The average Christian is worse off than the, inner, than the sinner man. You know why? They watch that stuff on TBN with all that witchcraft they do, and people are so ignorant they don't know anything about it. And if you tell them anything about it, they say, oh, that's, that's just not true. You have to love everybody. You can't be judging people now. You know, we have to deal with that stupidity because the Bible gives us the power with the Holy Ghost to judge, and this is what that means. The Bible doesn't ever change. And the Jews were always working witchcraft on the minds of people, going all the way through the Bible, ending at Revelations 18, 23. And you look, it's all there all the time. So why aren't we being told anything about that today? Because it hasn't been scientifically proven like they do with your medicines that they won't let you have. They want you to buy their pills, but I don't want to go into that. We're living in a very critical time, and I want to tell you about the word profundity. And if you look, I says number one here on the small page, I says bottomless. 
the property of being very deep, bottomless. How would you like to be bottomless? I mentioned on the first page, I mentioned people that are bottomless, they'll go deep with you. But there's going deep with the scriptures and there's another idea of going deep in stupidity. You know, today they want to get deep with you and oh, they told me, oh, you should pray for Brother Edmund and he'll run the pews. I'm sorry, that's not deep. It's intellectual depth that we're talking about. Being intellectually strong in your mind, going beyond what they want you to go. One of the first things you have to do in our society today, you have to learn about witchcraft. I pray over my mind every morning. There's not a no morning of my life that I don't bind the spirit of witchcraft, sorcery, mind control, imagination, bewitching, soothsayers. You know, the story goes on. Charmers. I mean, you have to, diviners, it goes on. You find out this has been a very much a part of our Bible. People believe that, oh yes, I was saved. Well, that's pretty stupid to believe you're saved from the same book that actually talks about all the witchcraft. You talk about mind control? How many of y'all know that Jesus set you free from mind control when you found out about hell? Now, I don't want to go into that anymore because this is a very important program. And what it means, I said number two, to apply knowledge and understanding or common sense to situations that we face. Many people have no common sense. They don't have any real knowledge. Number three, I said the intellectual ability to penetrate, penetrate deeply into ideas and situations in your life and things that you should and should not do. Number four, I said discerning, and this is one of the gifts we have of the Holy Ghost, discerning far below the surface or far into a subject. I think that's very important. Number five, I said, is enlarging the knowledge by appearing. And this is the method now I'm talking about here in number five, a method of enlarging your knowledge by appearing before him very early in the morning. It's called intellectual depth. Is it possible to change who you are? Number seven, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel from 2 Corinthians 4, 7. That's the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you notice something here, it says in verse 2, it uses the word deep poverty. I want you to look at this. Now this is very important. And it could be a matter of how far you go in your life. That's how important it is. It could be a matter of you ending up in a spiritual mental mess or you winding up having a great reward for God and being able to accomplish many things while you're here. So I want you to get an idea of this word deep poverty because it was this deep poverty, how they dealt with this, that caused them to be an abundant giver. These people, if you notice something, the poor saints at Jerusalem, they were having a hard time. They didn't have any food hardly. Not the Christians, because, you know, that was a Jewish town. And I'm sure there was Christians there, but they had poverty problems. They had food problems. They had everything. But if you notice something... <clears throat> I mean, we find out about this in Josephus. I won't talk about that now. We read about it. But look what he's telling them, these Corinthians, about the church of Macedonia and what they did. Now, I think you should learn this. This is a really cool idea. If you've got your little telephone with your strong Bible concordance on it, I'd like for you to follow me. And if you don't have that, you can get it. All you've got to do is go to the Google Play and download Strong's Bible Concordance. Make sure you get the Strong's and don't get that other stuff. Anyway, to make a long story short, you got 899. That's one of the words. 899. And the way I laid this out, I got 899 at the top. The next one, I've got 901. Then I've got a word here for 939. 
These are very important words. So I want to show you how to use them in order to actually profit yourself. If you learn this, you know, you'll get away from a lot of things. And when I say a lot of things, I mean, you know, everybody today is out for the money. They'll try to do anything to you they can do to get money out of you. But I think God wants us to be a little sharper than the average bear. Amen? Amen. So if you look at this word 899, it's got two impressive things in here. It says deepness, and it says also, uses the word profundity, and this comes from the word deep. Why would it have mystery on this? It's because mystery, you don't know how this happens. This is not mentioned any time in the Old Testament because they didn't have the Holy Spirit to pray. But we that have the Holy Spirit, we have an option. How many of y'all believe we can do great things? Amen. That's what the new man is. God empowered you as a Christian. When you got saved, He imparted the blood to you or sprinkled you with the blood and imparted His Spirit into you and you become a royal person with royal thoughts if you learn how to use them. And you have to copy the book of our Bible and put it into your mind. Stay with it. Keep learning these kind of things. That's what changes you and who you are. So you learn about the mystery and you learn how they dealt with this poverty. You find out later on in this that Titus, chapter 7, verse 13, he mentions Titus. Look at chapter 8, verse 6, he mentions Titus. Titus apparently had taught them these things and had changed the lives of them and the people there in Jerusalem and the many other people that have actually learned what we're talking about. So you find out that, let's read from verse 1, Moreover, my brethren, we do you to wit of the grace bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, now this grace helped them when they didn't have any money themselves. They were able to give and help other people. Now I don't want you to focus on money totally because that's just what happened in this church. This idea goes to anything that you try to accomplish. If you want to do better, learn the ideal of what I'm talking about today and I'll show you how that works. Because I believe that you can be deep and Bottomless. You know what that means? I mean, man, you don't have a limit. Some people have a limit. I know when you talk to denominations, I had a little Baptist lady, she had left. I've been teaching Sunday school for 20 years. My husband, if God wants to heal him, he knows where he's at. Well, needless, needless to say, her husband was dead <clears throat> in about three weeks. And all we was going to do is pray for him, but whatever. Those kind of people are fixed in their belief. And you know, you cannot change your Bible, amen? amen? The Bible said in Mark 16, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. John 5, or James 5, he said, you know, call for the elders of the church to lay, on, lay hands on them. Anoint them with oil, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And you look at Jesus all through our Bible, healing the sick, the apostles. Chapter 3, verse 10, you look at Peter. <clears throat> you look at everything he did in Acts chapter 3 when he prayed for the man that was crippled, being crippled from his mother's womb. These kind of people that are fixed in their mind, you can't help them. They've been indoctrinated by lies and deception and preachers that are ignorant themselves, sad to say. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about this word mystery. Never mentioned in the Old Testament. It holds the meaning of going beyond your normal fixed position. In other words, today I want to talk to you about breaking free. How many of y'all want to break free? Amen. Get away from the denominations. Get away from people that say, huh? Pay attention to them people. Amen? Amen. We believe our Bible. They don't even know the Bible. We're living in a time now when the average preacher, well... I'm sorry, but it just don't really work that way if you're following in the footsteps of Jesus. Hold the meaning of going beyond the extent of man as an average Christian. If you look up the word extent, you can see where I'm coming from. It's the idea that people have an extent that they will go to 
but they're not going to go any farther. But I believe God's wanting some people today to break out of this society. Our society is oppressed. Our society has been overcome with money people. They've taken down the church. You find out that the Masons were in the Baptist churches back in 1845. Yeah, they was in the Baptist churches then in Oklahoma Territory. <laughs> and you know, they are not, I mean, they're, some of them are probably nice people, the little Masons, and they don't have any idea what they're really serving when you look at the 33rd degree Masons, which in my opinion, from what I've learned, are nothing but a group of Satanists who worship money and the devil, and they control a lot of stuff in our country. But anyway, going beyond the extent, it says number three, the meaning holds the ideal of a mystery because of those who search deep things of God will not discover it, but it also because that they, it is never mentioned in the Old Testament. Here we see the creation of a person, basically. Now I left it, I kind of went short there. But you look at people, and I remember, I was telling them on a radio program back in the 70s, back whenever I first met Brother Ken here, I was in an all-night prayer meeting, and there was only about four or five of us. We was in a school building on the east side of Dayton, and I don't know what brought the subject up. We just started praying. We were walking around the church praying, and before long it was 11 o'clock, and before long it was 12 o'clock, and they lived in the church. I didn't. I lived on North Dixie. And before long, you know, I went down to White Tower real quick and got us a cup of coffee. And before long, I, I looked up and it was like getting daylight. And I said, well, you know, whatever. We went ahead and prayed a little bit more and I waited, watched my clock. And I went down to the city hall. It was Monday morning. The city building on 3rd Street in those days. And we went inside and the... Uh, I told the guy, I said, I'd like to be a Dayton City Jail Minister. <clears throat> and he said, wait a minute, you've got to go with me. So he took me upstairs to see the man with the brass, you know, the yellow stuff on his shirt and all that. And he said, well, why should we do this for you? He said, we've got 100 guys a week are asking this. I said, because you know what? I can reach these people and I can help them. I've been out there in the streets with them. I know how they live. I know how they think. They know me and I know them. I said, but furthermore, you don't need anybody else because I'm not a denominational person. Amen. So we just stayed with our Bible. And you know what? I got a letter in the mail a couple days later. He awarded us the Dayton City Jail Ministry, which I was there and had it for five years. <clears throat> and it all came about, in my opinion, as the midnight and the all-night prayer meeting. And I believe today, I don't care what your situation is, I want to tell you how to face things. And you look at this stuff here like in eight, chapter 8, verse 2. This church was suffering great poverty, but they decided by seeking God, and that word deep tells you what they did in chapter 8, verse 2. You look at 901. 901 is the second level root word. It means going down very early. 901. Type it in your little phone or look it up in the Strong's if you got one in your stuff there. To rise very early. Not early. Some people look at seven or six o'clock as being early. I don't look at that. Jesus walked on the water when it was what? The fourth watch? That's after somewhere around three o'clock or maybe a little later. You look at the miracles he did. How many times he walked on the water? How many times he spoke to the wind? And how many times he did these things? You know, there's a pattern in our Bible that will show you how to be a miraculous person. You look at this number 901. Look what it says. Meaning going down very early. Very early. It leads to the word in the Old Testament as profound. This is normally seen in those that rise early to pray or stay all night in prayer meeting. And Jesus, as Jesus did when he chose his disciple, as what they said in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. Jesus prayed all the night long and he got up and after he prayed, he chose the disciples. One of the other little things that I thought was interesting on this, that rising very early, you know what it came to me? It lists the word 142 in your Strong's Bible Dictionary. And you know what it means? Say it with me, say rapture. Rapture. <laughs> you better say rapture, because if you miss the rapture, brother, you'd be hurting in this world. There's a lot of hell coming down the road. But this is a very important word. It leads to rapture. The 901 leads to rapture. 
you want to confirm that a little bit, I think 37, 35, or is it 37, 22? I thought it was 22, but it might be 35. I've got 35 written down. The whole idea is that it just tells you about rising up early in that other number. And uh, I think that's important, but it's not something that we have to know because we know what early is because of 19, 901. Now, if you look at this in the next level of the root word, 939, look what this means. If you've got a strong, look it up. 939, it means to pace, to walk. What are they talking about? Well, this is what you learn in the scriptures. You learn that we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen. You learn to take advantage of the faith that God give you while you've got time. Don't wait till you get to heaven to use your faith because there ain't going to be nothing up there. We're going to have a new body. We're going to be like him. Whatever you do, you better do it here now. God gave you the faith to make you a great person. You can be a failure as a Christian or you can be a successful person and do all of the work God said you could do. What I call a failure is people that have no prayer life, people that won't study their Bible, people that are in a fixed position. Well, I just believe my nomination, buddy. Oh, I believe Bishop so-and-so. He's a real man of God. You know, I believe if anybody stays with the Scripture, they'll do okay. Amen? Amen? I think this is very encouraging and very healthy. I'd like to keep you in perfect health. So it says this, this church here at Macedonia, <coughs> in chapter 8, verse 1, how that in a great trial of affliction, in verse 2, the, and the abundance of their joy. Now I want you to notice the combination here. The great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty led to this last two words in verse 2. Liberty, their liberty, abounded in the riches of their liberty. What does that mean? <clears throat> These people became able to use what money they were getting, which was extra above anything, God not only broke the poverty off them, but He gave them everything they need to be able to minister to other people. Now remember this, this does not go to yourself for that purpose. I mean, you can't do like Fred Price. He used to talk about, yeah, he had Rolls Royce. Yeah, and he talked about his Rolls Royces and he talked about, you know, don't fool with that Dake's Bible. He's prejudiced. We know the Jews hired him to do that. They've been trying to cause racism in this country all along. But anyway, I won't, I won't go there for right now. You find out that you use money to minister to people. That's what you're for. Remember, God didn't come here to give you this great life. He came here to show you a pattern that you can live by that will be accepted by the Father. It will be anointed. It will bring you a great reward. Jesus never owned any property. You look at guys today, man, they're taking the hair in a heartbeat. Yeah, I'll take all you can give me, man. Jesus never owned any property. He wasn't a part of this world. He never had no great money laid up. He come in riding on an ass. Leroy Jenkins jumped up one time in church and said, well, yeah, he said he might have been riding on an ass, but the other disciples is walking. I just laughed at him. He's crazy anyway. But anyway, make a long story short. Jesus led a life that's a pattern for us to study. Amen? Amen. And to follow with the pattern. So if you notice something, these three things work together. The abundance of their joy. Now some people have no joy when they don't have no money. <laughs> what is Money, if you ain't spent your money crazy, if you buying everything, giving it to everybody, and you know, I believe in giving, don't get me wrong, but you don't give nobody just cause you know who they are and cause they your family. Amen. You learn to pray over your stuff. Amen. You learn to sow your seed at the right time. I mean, there's some family, I don't mind helping them, but there's some of them, man, my, my mama used to say, and I know Sister Cofield said, you get in jail, buddy, you get yourself out. You know, that's just what you do. But anyway, some people can't say no, and I understand that. 
But the deep poverty they had and their great tribulation in this deep poverty. But they didn't lose their joy and they kept on praising God. Isn't that good? And you know what? They was energized, just led by the Spirit. And they began to rise up early, very early and pray. Now, people don't know really why that we always, I mean, years ago, man, I pick them up for prayer meeting, pick them up for uh, every kind of meeting. I keep them all night. I keep them all week. We locked in one time out five days in church. And I had more miracles in our church. I had crutches, hearing aids. I had stuff all over the church. People got healed, delivered, fasting and prayer. Mother Webb come in with a stroke and her mouth moved all up here and she has on dialysis. She fasted with us four days. In the middle of the, after the four days, we was about four and a half days, she come to me and said, look, Pastor, look at here. I looked and her mouth straightened up. Her daughter come in and said, well, you taking your medicine, Mama? She said, yeah, Charlene, here. Charlene turned her head, threw it in the garbage. She was healed in her kidneys to the day she died. You see, you got to take a limit off God. If you listen to people, you ain't gonna never get nothing out of his life. Look where they're at. This is the biggest backslidden country in the world now. Because they've got all the preachers here and ain't none of them hardly telling the truth and they think they're preaching. But they haven't stayed in the scriptures long enough and under a real preacher to learn how to study their self. There's a few of them trying and if they got about 20 or 30 years to study, they might make it. Without somebody teaching them, that's kind of the chances that they have. Anyway, if you look at this, <clears throat> you'll find out that verse 2 tells you a lot of things. Uh, a lot of things. Deep poverty abounded and the riches of their liberality. That means they had a lot. You look at this rich, it's, un, you know, it's kind of like deep. I don't know how much money they got or how much they did, but notice what their motive was. The Jews that were saved, which were our brethren, that's the real Israel of God, they were giving them food and they were ministering to them. There was a lot of people there in Israel in those days. This was before the temple was destroyed. So, you know, we see that there's some great things that happened and they became very wealthy in this sense. Now, I know they did not go out and get them a jet airplane and a Rolls Royce and get them a brand new $100,000 truck and all that stuff. It wasn't about that. Naked you come in this world and naked you're going to go. Paul said to be content with food and clothing. Amen? Amen. I mean, everybody has to work because if you don't work, you don't eat. But that don't mean you got to have all this high dollar stuff and all that kind of crazy stuff because that's not who we are. Jesus never did that. Paul never did it. But you see, they have taken ideas. Turn your Bible a little bit there. Go to chapter 9, 8. I'm sorry. Go to chapter 8, verses 8. I want to show you what they have did to you. They have taken the people in their country and blasphemed the Bible, blasphemed the Word of God. And these people, man, they're going to pay for this. These people are going to burn, burn, burn because they're big liars. It says 8, 8. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Look what he said now. For you know the grace of God, of our Lord, Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through your riches, through, your, through, through his poverty, you might be made rich. Now, they turn that around and talk about God wants you to be rich and everything. But it's a bunch of blaspheming liars. Let me tell you what it means. How many of y'all know what a royal person is? Say amen. amen. How many of y'all know what it says in Revelations chapter 1, verses 5 and 6? He said, God made us kings. We have eternal life. We're rich who we are. The minute you're saved, you become eternally so rich, you can't be any richer simply because we own the world, everything in it. What are you going to do? Make me rich and give me some more of what I already own? All the money these guys have got today, they're going to be divided up against, uh, amongst us. Amen? Amen? I mean, whenever Jesus comes back, we're going to divide the wealth of the heathen. It's going to be us. 
He made us rich by sprinkling us with His blood. Now it's up to you to follow His pattern, to live like Him, and then you can be accepted. If you want to get this ideal, I mean, we put a lot of money, I'm not bragging or anything, but we put a lot of money in the radio every month. People don't know how much we put in the radio. We put about $10,000 a month in the radio. How many of y'all believe everybody will help us? If you believe that, you believe wrong. We got about one tither. Another guy gives us $50 a month. We got one, you sometimes give us 100. You know, people don't want to help you, man. Not when you preach in the Bible. Now, if I, I mean, they will give the so-called God's holy people money, but they never learned the idea that there's two Israels. Can I hear an amen? amen. There's an Israel of God, and that's Jesus Christ. And there's an Israel that's not of God, and that's the flesh, and that's the people that live there. Has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. So we've got times that we're living in, people need to know this stuff. Are they going to tell them? No, because they've got to come up with big money, convince you that you're blessed by giving them money, and it goes to pay them Jews that they work for on TBN. Whatever. I don't really mind. Let them do what they're doing. <coughs> Let's go back to eight, chapter 8, look at verse 3. Their power, he said, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. And this is what it is. You should be willing of yourself to go beyond what you're willing to do if you want to take the limit off yourself. Now, some people live in a limit. They're not willing to go any farther. I know some of the preachers, Brother Pat, Brother Lett, my pastor, used to be, some things he was really good at. He said, I want a faith offering this week. He said, I want you to get into your pocket and give something that you cannot afford to give. He said, no, I want you to pay your tithe. If you owe your tithe, pay that. He said, but I'd like for those that are willing to give something they cannot afford to give. Now, you remember Jesus clarified this when he said the little widow woman cast in all she had. It's just two minds. You know, like probably what you get in a quarter today. She took two quarters and threw them in the offering. And Jesus said, she gave more than the rest of you guys because she gave all she had. <laughs> I'm not going to say that Jesus didn't say that because he did. And I believe that a lot of people today, if they practice that, how many of y'all know they'd use their faith, which God gave them, and by this great faith, he created the worlds. But you know, I think everything has a price to pay. So let's go this a little bit farther. Verse 4, Praying us with much entreaty, much prayer, that we would receive the gift. He wanted Paul and them to receive the gifts that they had taken up in this offering to be sent to Jerusalem and to take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. That was their idea, to minister to the saints. And no, they didn't take any of the offering. It all went to the saints. Amen? And number five, look what it said in verse five. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first they give their own selves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So if you want to do any of these things and practice these whole ideas, you wind up making a double commitment to God. God, I am going to seek your face. I'm going to learn because to get up early in the morning, that shouldn't be hard for you if you ain't up to the world and stand up at night and watching these heathens commit fornication on television and tell you a bunch of witchcraft lies. It's easy to get up in the morning and pray. And when people do that, they can learn things. You can break through the power of that intellectual barrier. And I think we're living in that today. You need to be able to see through the devil. Amen? Amen. You need to be able to see through the devil and what he's doing. And I think people today that don't see that, they've got problems because they probably don't seek the Lord. God gave you a gift. In the middle of this paper, the one that's fully printed, I use the word gifts there. The gift of the Holy Ghost is referred to in Strong's. It's 5486. This refers to another part of our divine nature which was given as a free gift when we received Christ as our Savior. In Scripture, this is called the Comforter in John 14. And this gift gives the believer power to be delivered from the dangers and from passions, 
fears, all these things. From the sin nature, He lifts you above the things of this world. That's what He's all about. It's an endowment given by God which qualifies a believer as a miraculous person. How many of y'all want to be a miraculous person? Now all of these miraculous persons and this miraculous gifts He's given to you bears the idea that if you follow Jesus in the Scriptures, it's okay. You can know these things. You know, many people that don't listen and they don't follow Paul, I mean, it's not going to work for them. I want to give you two good scriptures. In, in, first, in first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, look at this. First Corinthians 11, 1. And while you're there, you can mark down and get ready. I want you to look at 6, 4, 2. I'll give you a scripture while you're looking at at Ephesians 3, 8. Paul said that I am the least of the least. See, all the apostles was taught to be little people. They was never taught to be great. They argue coming back with amongst themselves. Who's going to be greatest in the world to come? Who's going to be greatest? And Jesus rebuked them. He said, the greatest amongst you shall be the least. Our kingdom don't work like the world. The greatest among you shall be the least. The least among you. Don't work like the world. And you bring a little child to them. And except you become this little child. They didn't know what that meant. It means to humble yourself before God. Because you ain't nothing but a creature. You ain't no big person inside of God. Amen? 1 Corinthians 11, 1, what did Paul tell them? Be ye followers of me. You see this? Now you get this ideal in you, and you can begin to prosper. See, he said, as I also am of Christ. Why would he write this about Christ? Because 1 Peter 2, 21, you find out that you are, you are supposed to follow the footsteps of Jesus and do what he did. What about 1 Corinthians 6, 4? Paul had no confidence in the flesh and great people that's so smart they can do everything. He didn't have any confidence in them at all. He said, if there's any matters of this world, let it be known. You got somebody that has to be a judge or something? Get the least one among you. Don't get one of these smart guys that think they know everything. He said, get one of the least amongst you. So you wind up following Paul because Jesus was the least of the least. He never owned any property, never had a big bank vault, never had any of this kind of stuff. And you know what? He, he, he ministered to people. And he had the power of God in his life. I mean, he was God himself. But you know, he's following a pattern to lay down for you to show you how to live the life that you might be rich with him. Because if you don't live according to the Bible, you ain't going to never have anything even when you get to heaven. 1 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> you know, you find out some interesting things. What is it? 1 Corinthians 3.10. You find out some things about that where if you were to make it, you ain't going to have no reward if you don't stay with the Bible. Amen? Amen. Talking about 310 all the way down. If you build on something to 10 to 15, you find out you built upon the Bible. You build upon Jesus Christ. That's what the whole ideal is. If you don't take 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and follow the footsteps of Jesus, you're not going to have anything. How many people you know today, to them, everything's about money? Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through, what is it, 15? And then tell me if you find money on there other than Jesus Christ. What do you find? You find that you build up on Jesus. You don't build up on wood, hay, stubble, stone, diamonds, gold, anything. You follow the footsteps of Jesus. That's where the whole thing goes. But you see, that's the opposite of our life today. We have been reversed in scriptures ever since way before I got saved. I know that. But when I got saved, there's already in the television and preaching in reverse. They had, you know... These guys like Copeland, he was on TV when I got saved, him and Jimmy Swaggart. But I believe they're both a couple of Jews, or either they've been bought by the Jews and there's a pretty stupid one. 
because neither one of them preached the truth. You know, neither one of them. They were both way off base. Jimmy Swaggart with everything. He's so rich and he lies so much. You can't believe anything he says to hear him tell it. All you got to do is look on the internet, exposing Jimmy Swaggart, and you'll see. He'd been exposed with more sex stuff. And that's the biggest, one of the biggest things that they do in Israel today, in June of every year, they celebrate their sexuality. To them, it's a sin to be, I don't know what you say, promiscuous or celibate. What about celibate? In other words, if you ain't having sex, that's a sin. That's the opposite of Christians. Amen? Okay, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Now, I want to give you some solid advice, and I want you to look in Romans chapter 4, verse 12. Romans 4, verse 12. Isn't it cool to be a Christian? Man, I tell you, don't you wish somebody would come up and smack you in the face over Jesus? Wouldn't it be Maurice? What if one of them guys was downtown knocking people out? What if they come by and knock you out because you was a Christian? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? I mean, come on, man. It, it is really cool to be... I mean, the disciples really went outside of the city and they rejoiced because they whipped them with them whips. Wham! They beat them up and they go outside. And say, oh, thank you, Jesus. They were able to suffer for the kingdom of God. In chapter 4, I want you to look at verse 12. And it says, And the father, Abraham, is a father of circumcision. Now, let me tell you where this goes, first of all. Abraham was 430 years before Moses and the circumcision and the law. Amen? Amen? So everything Abraham did, it follows upon those people by faith instead of under the law. So you learn, don't let them tell, oh, that was tithing was under the law. Tell them, shut up, devil. Abraham tithed a tenth of what he had 430 years before the law ever come along. And these bunch of idiots want to tell you that so they can trick you out of your money. But anyway, verse 12, Romans 4. And the father circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of what? That faith that our Abraham, our father Abraham had yet been uncircumcised before circumcision even come along. That's 430 years before that. So how many of y'all believe in walking in the steps of Abraham? Amen. Okay, I want you to look what this says. Beginning at 17. <clears throat> and as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. In other words, Abraham believed before God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things as not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now there was no hope. How many of y'all believe that God is able? Huh? When there is no hope and it's gone, it's gone, man. There ain't no hope. You're supposed to get downtown and go to work at 10, 15 if your car is gone when you get out there and you ain't got no money for a cab and you know it's 10, 05 anyway, it'd be, ain't no use to think about that because you ain't going. Well, this is kind of like that, but a little different. The idea is that, look here what it says. I'm going to read this to you. I think this is pretty good. On this back page here, the small part, look at the second, the middle paragraph. Romans 4, 18 through 21. Against hope, he still believed in hope. And in Romans 4, 17, 18, and 19, we find that Abraham, against hope, Believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations. God had said that to him, but look, it was finished, man. Sarah was now 95 years old. Her womb was dead. Abraham was 100. He couldn't have sex. How you going to have a baby? It ain't possible. But against hope, he still believed in God. Wait a minute. I don't care what this 
stuff that I'm looking at says. He says, I'm going to believe God. God said it, I'm just going to go on and believe it. So look what he said here. Abraham only had the word of God as his promise. Certain scriptures are believed to be ambiguous or hard to understand. And our scriptures are like John 14, 6. It says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So the Lord, he quickened the deadness of Sarah's womb. I kind of like that. Look in the last of the 19th verse. He quickened the deadness of her womb. God told that womb, he said, hey womb, I want you to operate. The womb said, yes sir, what am I going to do, boss man? Come on, man, this is just kind of the way it works. God talks to water. I mean, the waters fear when they see God. The whole idea is that God did it, amen? amen. Turn with me quickly over here to Acts chapter 27. Now, <clears throat> I heard a guy say one time, he said, God, you ought to quit that. He said, the way you operate, God, you do this stuff, it's so deep. He said, y'all, quit that stuff, God. But God said to him, that's who I am, boy. So the whole idea that God don't operate on man's level, amen? amen. Now look at this stuff in Acts 27. You see, you're to follow Abraham. Now y'all got that right, huh? You follow in the footsteps of Abraham. So what does that tell you? You got to believe against hope. When there is no hope, God tells you to believe. That's faith. If God come down here and tell you here now, here's your penny sucker, <laughs> and give you a penny, that wouldn't be nothing. God wants you to do something with your faith. In Acts chapter 27, look what it says. They were in the ship, and they were taking Paul to Rome while he's in prison. Paul had told them that he should not depart. In verse 10, chapter 27, said unto them, Sir, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing and the ship, but also of our lives. Well, they didn't consider him to be anybody. But look what happened. Lo and behold, go down to verse uh, 20. We'll start reading there if you want to. Let's look at uh, verses 18. The storm had started. The Bible said in verse 14, there arose against it tempestuous wind the call uh, Eurocladon. Maybe it was Eurocladon. I don't know where the accent is there, but it was something similar. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up the wind, we let her drive herself. They turned the loose of the rudder and it started going. You look at this very carefully. <clears throat> it says in verse 17, which they had taken up, they used help ungirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into quicksand and strike the sail of the ship. And so this ship was driven by the wind. Verse 18, being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. They took their load and started throwing it away. They was afraid they was going to, I guess, hit the bottom of rocks and sink. So if they lightened the ship, it came up more out of the water. Verse 19, And the third day we cast out our hands, with our own hands, the tackling of the ship. Now I want you to get this verse 20. They're in a ship. They're in the winter time. They're going through this weather and the ship was being tossed, that it's breaking up the ship. They're thinking they're going to die. It eventually does break up the ship. But at this time, they're fasting. They hadn't ate anything. Verse 20, Acts 27. And when there neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, neither one of them, there was no small tempest. The word tempest is talking about a winter storm, if you look it up in it's a pretty big thing. All hope that we should be saved were then taken away. Did you see this? Now you remember this. You follow the footsteps of Abraham. Wasn't no way for him and Sarah, but God did it. Amen? Amen. 
You follow when there is no hope. God can't get any glory out of you. I mean, if everything's just hunky-dory in your life. Amen. You know, so you look at this verse 20. He said, look, there ain't no more hope, man. The ship is gone. We can't control it no more. And the ship's doing all this stuff and they're holding and they hadn't ate. Look what it said in verse 14. Of, uh, I think it's kind of interesting. I thought I said verse 14. On the 14th day, it's verse 33. I'm sorry. Verse 33, And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take some meat and eat it. This day is the 14th day that they have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. So he kind of encouraged them to eat. And I think this was a good thing that they did for their health's sake. But there was no hope. But he told them, verse 27, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we driven up and down in Adrian, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near unto some country. And they measured the depth of it, and it was twenty phantoms, and it was fifteen phantoms. And Paul said to them in verse 31 to the centurion and to the soldiers, except you abide in this ship, you can't be saved. You're going to be lost, all of you. Because they were getting a boat out and going to put it out in the ocean and try to get into an island. But they tied up and the ideal of this story is <coughs> that they had in verse 37, they had 276 men on this ship. And they anchored the ship, but the water was hitting it so hard, the ship busted up. They busted the back out of the ship. The water started coming in. And they were going to kill the soldiers. The soldiers were going to kill the prisoners that they were taking to Rome. But they didn't do it. The centurion that was with Paul, he said, no, we're not going to do it that way. Let every man swim to the shore. So they get out in the water and they started swimming. Cold water, wind waves over their head. There was no way they could be saved. But you know what? It was against all hope. And my prayer today is that the people could learn from this message. You look in chapter 4 of Romans, beyond any hope. There was no hope. When there is no way, God can make a way. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You find out that he said, what is it? In John 14, 14? Or 14, I think it is 14, 14, or 14, 12. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said that in verse 6 of John 14. But he went on to say, anything you ask in my name, he said, I'll do it. And these things are real. Our scriptures are real. Our Bible is just not written you know, you look at 1 John 5, 14, he says, you know what? If you ask anything according to his will, he'll do it. So people should learn what the will of God is. Stay in your Bible, learn that. Don't spend your time learning trash things. Watch people yesterday, they're so into the internet or so into the television watching football games. How many of y'all know that's created by the Jews to take up your time? Created by the devil that's trying to destroy your time and put things into your mind that you don't have a need of. That's all that stuff is for. Football, basketball, baseball. They want to make you look like it's so real. No, oh, he gets $85 million a year. Well, they don't care. He's just going to put it in the bank and get on to spend so much of it. It's going to stay right there and they still own it because it's their banks. You know, we're living in a critical time when people's knowledge has gone far away from the Scriptures. You look here, God specializes in the things where there is no hope. He specializes in turning your life around. The thing that I brought this out with the word profundity is a time they rose early in the morning to get the mysteries, to get things of God, knowing not what you're going to get. You may ask for one thing and God give you something else. God knows what you have need of before you ask. Amen? Amen? You can learn the ideal of seeking God. and Just seek His face to see what He'll do. 
Oh, well, he wouldn't do nothing. You need to go somewhere and sit down. Take that fluoride out of your mouth and all that old other old stuff. You don't never know what God's going to do. Amen? Amen? I mean, we're looking at a God that used his words. Was he rich? Yes, he created the universe. And he still owns it, amen? They like to get up there and tell everybody they went to the moon. That's a bunch of lies. That they got about a billion dollars a year out of. I don't know how many billion. Way over a hundred billion, maybe a half a trillion. Like we're supposed to believe it because they said it and they had them fake video, them Hollywood movies they put up there to make people believe they've been to the moon. How many of y'all believe they've been to the moon? Huh? Oh yes, I believe it because I saw it on Fox News. That's a, that's a big lie, isn't it? I'm sorry that people are so brainwashed. But that just goes to show you who our people are and what, what they believe. They're nice people. Oh, I just believe people and you shouldn't judge now. I'm sorry that people have that attitude. That's brainwashing. That's been brought on by the devil. But we that love Jesus, I believe there's a breakthrough coming. How many of y'all believe it? Amen. How many of y'all believe that we need to start believing for things where there's no hope? I don't know. We got little things going on right now. God's going to have to work it out. Some things. I don't know how God's going to do it, but how many of y'all believe he'll do it? Come on, man. We live for him. We walk, we walk with him every day. We get up every morning and we serve him. We spend our lives preaching his word, talking his programming. Program your minds with the word of God, and then you can be the king God wants you to be. It's hard for you to be a king when you've got the mind of a pauper. Amen? Amen? You want the mind of a king? Put the mind of Jesus out of the scriptures and look at what? Second chapter, 1 Corinthians, what is it, 2.16? That's a good scripture. What does that mean? It says you got the mind of Christ. I'm going to talk to you that's wise. You've been perfected. Once you begin to learn what these words mean, it means that God has developed you through study, prayer, reading your Bible, he'll develop you with a higher level of mental and moral growth. To be intellectually deep, remember this. Rise up with God in the morning and let him change who you are. Rise up with God and begin to pray. Begin to ask God what he wants to do with your life. Begin to ask God what he's got in store for you. I don't care who you are. If you do that, you may have no education at all. And it's probably a lot better. Once you get this honest education in you, you probably ain't going to go nowhere. But if you rise up early in the morning like that, you begin to get before God and say, God, what do you have in store for me? You know I'm a nobody. You've got to help me. Then God will begin to raise you up. And that's the prophecy of Hannah. All the way back, 1 Samuel. God's able to raise up a beggar to a dung, from a dunghill and make him a king. <clears throat> You've got to learn that flesh, no flesh can glory in the presence of God. Nothing you can think of is going to impress God. Everything you think of will probably be wrong. But you learn to believe beyond hope. I thank God for hope. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. So if you've got things you're hoping and believing God for, start using your faith with it. Get in a prayer meeting. Start lifting it before God. Can I hear an amen? amen? Come on, point your finger this way and let's pray for the people that watch our program. Let's believe God together. Father, we ask you to help our people, Lord, to minister to people that's watching our program, to help them to bind the demon of lies and bind the demon of witchcraft that's trying to stop them. Bind that demon of mental illness and sickness and disease. Say it with me. Say, devil, we break your power in the name of Jesus. We cast you out, devil. We know who you are. Imagination, we cast you down. Sorcery, we cast you down. And say it with me, Father, I believe you for my miracle. For my miracle growth.